So let me introduce our speakers for today. For the last several years, the APS has been blessed to participate in the Explore America Summer Internship Program hosted at the CV Star Center at Washington College. This internship has enabled bright undergraduates to spend the summer working um, to be basically paid to intern with us for 10 weeks on different digital projects. When Jawan Johnson, the assistant director of the Star Center, reached out to us last fall, I knew immediately that having an intern's work on the Maryland Loyalism Project would be a perfect tie-in for the new David Center for the American Revolution that we are currently onboarding at the APS. Uh, and I very much thank Jawan for being with us today. Uh, it's great for all the support that you've offered Elizabeth and Jillian uh, and all the, you know, all the other fellows that we've had. Uh, so thank you again for being here. And anybody else from the Star Center who's joining us, thank you uh, for joining us today. Um, as the pandemic emerged in the spring, I think it became pretty clear that the uh, Star Fellow, Star Intern, wasn't going to be able to be on site. And I think Elizabeth and Jillian remember when we first started talking, it was like, oh, you'll just be, you know, remote for a couple of weeks, then you can kind of drive in. Well, that never happened. <laughs> We're all still, still pretty remote. Uh, but they, the offer is open for them to come to the APS when it's safe uh, to see all of our treasures and to, to meet all of the staff in person. Um, we also, uh, you know, so when it became clear we had to do it remote, we, we shifted tack pretty quickly. Um, but in the process, we were blessed not just to have one, but to have two great interns to work with us. Um, so I think it's really been uh, a silver lining for us. Uh, so let me introduce the two interns. Uh, Jillian Curran is a rising junior at Washington College, where she is majoring in history with a double minor in art history and medieval and early modern studies. Jillian brought with her experience working on the Maryland 400 project at the Maryland State Archives. And this is a project which I encourage you to check out. It recovers the experience of Maryland patriots in the American Revolution. We're well happy to bring you over to the side of loyalists this summer. So you have a full view on the American Revolution. Um, she's also worked on the Chesapeake Heartland project, which recovers the experience of African Americans in 19th century Kent County, Maryland, where Washington College is located. Uh, another project which I think you'll see has really helped uh, shape her thinking on her work this summer. She plans to pursue a career in historical research or the museum field following her education, and she spent the summer working from her home in Kennett Square, Maryland. Uh, our other star fellow, Elizabeth Lilly, is a rising senior at Washington College in Chestertown, Maryland, where she is pursuing a Bachelor of Arts in Philosophy and Sociology. Um, but we've discovered that she is an equally good historian, uh, so I, I encourage you to claim that title as well. Uh, Elizabeth serves as the president of the Student Government Association at Washington College. Uh, previous to that, she's worked uh, in both the admissions office and chaired the honor board. She spent previous summers as the office manager for Group Mission Trips, an organization that facilitates home repair mission trips with over 100 volunteers. And she's working towards a career in public interest law. And she has spent her summer working from home in Carroll County, Maryland. And it's been great to have somebody on the ground in Maryland to help us understand the landscape as we've done this work. Uh, they've both been working with myself and with Benjamin Bankhurst, who is Assistant Professor of History at Shepherd University and the 2020-2021 David Center for the American Revolution Research Fellow. He is the award-winning author of Ulster Presbyterians and the Scots-Irish Diaspora, 1750 to 1763, and he's also the co-director of the Maryland Loyalism Project, uh, a digital initiative which you will soon hear about, which makes publicly available sources pertaining to loyalism in the Upper South during the age of the American Revolution. Uh, and as we will, you know, unfortunately, we again had kind of hoped that Professor Bankhurst would have joined us in person to fulfill his research fellowship this summer, but we are excited that we're going to get him uh, to join us next summer. And uh, before, I'm going to stop speaking soon, I promise. <laughs> as you'll soon hear, the Maryland Loyalism Project began as a team taught course at Loyola University Chicago and Shepherd University. And I want to give a special welcome to Kathy Young and athlete Ashley Howdeshell of Loyola University Special Collections and Archives, who are on the call today. Um, I especially want to thank them for all the support <clears throat> in the early phases of this project. It's not often that when you work at a university, you can brag that your archivists and good friends will buy original American Revolution material for you to use in your courses. So Ashley and Kathy, thank you so much for all of your support. And I'm looking forward to hearing what you think of this newest iteration of the project. 
So let me now turn this over to uh, Ben Bankhurst, and I'm going to pull up uh, the slides uh, for the presentation. Ben will go first, uh, followed by Elizabeth and Jillian. Great. Well, thank you, Kyle, and thanks uh, thanks again to the American Philosophical Society for uh, for hosting us today, and um, also to the Star Center for our, for providing us with such wonderful and engaged uh, uh, interns for this project. Um, also, I would like to thank the the archival staff at Loyola University because my students benefited from those purchases as well, as it was a team taught uh, class with uh, with Loyola. Okay, so uh, today uh, I, I'm just going to provide a, a bit of background about the Maryland uh, Loyalism Project and about Maryland Loyalism writ large. So if we go to the uh, first uh, slide here, uh, I'll, I'm just going to go over a few of the uh, few of the bigger questions that we faced when we were setting up this project and give you some background information as to uh, how it came came to being. Uh, firstly, uh, one of the big questions that we faced over the last few years has been the, qu the question of what, how to define a loyalist or loyalism. Uh, we've decided, and I think off the back of the work that our interns have done over the summer, uh, has really informed this decision to take a broad uh, perspective on the question of loyalism. Uh, traditionally, loyalism is seen as a sort of an ideological stand. Uh, but what we've decided to do, in, specifically in incorporating the voices of black loyalists, uh, is to, uh, to think about sort of uh, the, the material uh, conditions that lead one to choose sides uh, in Maryland in the, in the era of the American Revolution, and to take into consideration issues of self-interest and different definitions of freedom. Uh, so our de definition is one that can encompass both uh, white and black loyalists. Um, another question is why Maryland? Why did we choose Maryland as our case study? And the simple answer to that question is uh, it's it's not really been done. The last book on Maryland loyalism came out in the mid 19 or the early 1980s, I should say, uh, and there hasn't really been much interest, uh, scholarly interest in the subject uh, up until uh, up until very recently. Uh, unlike Virginia or the Carolinas or indeed New York, uh, where the story of loyalism is well told. Uh, Maryland is sort of this this uh, this underdeveloped narrative. So we thought uh, we we should uh, it would be a perfect colony uh, slash state uh, to uh, to base our our our, sub, our our project around. It is also fairly self-contained. Uh, as you're about to see, we're going to talk about the the Loyalist Claims Commission, which is one of the um, bodies of uh, of uh, which created one of the bodies of primary sources that our interns worked with over the course of this project. Um, when it comes to, to Maryland, there are only uh, four or five uh, volumes of pertinent material. So it was a, it was a chunk of, uh, of source material that we could really uh, get our heads around and that we could, uh, we could uh, do, do justice uh, towards. Um, this project really emerged, and if we could go to the next slide, um, out of uh, two team taught digital history classes uh, that uh, Dr. Robertson and myself taught over the course of the springs of 2017 and the autumn of 2019. Uh, the, the course that we, dis we, we created was, uh, we entitled um, the, the Revolution Will Be Digitized, which I thought was a really clever title. Um, uh, and it was a digital history course uh, with uh, content pertinent to the era of the American Revolution. So our students, instead of writing sort of the traditional essays, uh, created uh, websites, uh, used different tools to analyze data, et cetera. And it was a way for us to, uh, to expose them uh, to the burgeoning world of the digital humanities while still keeping a focus on the Maryland loyal, uh, sorry, on the, uh, the American Revolution. Um, within that course, one of these one of the assignments was to adopt a Merrill, uh, was to adopt a loyalist, uh, and that really got us thinking about uh, about the uh, the nature of the source material that we were working with, uh, the the claims uh, filed to the British government as part of the uh, the uh, peace negotiations in 1783 are incredibly rich uh, in biographic uh, and financial information. Uh, and we thought it was a real shame that most of that information is languishing behind paywall, uh, paywalls on genealogical websites and the like. So uh, we, we decided to take the leap and to, uh, 
to apply for a Lapidus Digital Initiatives Grant through the Alejandro Institute for Early American Studies in order to digitize a portion of the, uh, the, the Claims Commission uh, material pertinent to, this, to, the, uh, to the, uh, the colony of Maryland. So that, let's, let's quickly talk about the source base that we used, uh, that we relied upon for the project. Uh, and we, we've, we've really focused our attention on two uh, corpus, uh, uh, corpuses of material. First, uh, the Claims Commission records. And I'll give you a quick part of history of the Loyalist Claims Commission. Uh, so the Loyalist Claims Commission was a, uh, was, uh, a, a body that was formally uh, created by an act of parliament in 1783 and reestablished uh, in the year uh, following the peace treaty of, of, of Paris. In 1784 and 85, and their primary uh, objective was to uh, evaluate the lost property claims made by loyalist refugees, both in Canada and the British Isles, uh, and to uh, to ascertain the validity of those claims and to, as, as best they could, uh, uh, pay out um, uh, uh, monies to suffering loyalists. Uh, this was an attempt to compensate uh, loyalist refugees for the, their loyalty. So loyalists who went before the LCC had to A, prove the value of the property they lost in America, but also had to prove their, uh, their commitment to the, the cause of the crown, right? To, to prove their commitment uh, to uh, the, uh, the British war effort. Obviously there are some uh, loyalist refugees who make it to the United Kingdom who are at a distinct disadvantage on those fronts, and namely, and I'll leave those uh, a discussion of loyalist women, for instance, uh, to Jillian uh, and to Elizabeth to talk about in a second. Uh, there were over 5,000 claims submitted to the Loyalist Claims Commission, uh, and a, totaling over eight million pounds in lost property. As you can see here, uh, the the total payouts were just over three million, uh, so less than half of the money asked uh, for was compensated to loyalist refugees. And I've included two images of some of, of the uh, commissioners. There were five initially. Uh, Colonel uh, Colonel Henry Dundas was a uh, was a, uh, a British military officer in America, and he kind of oversaw the Canadian side of things. So the refugees that made it to Halifax or to New Brunswick. Uh, he, he sat in the commission uh, over there, tabulated that data and sent it to London. Uh, James Coke, the, the other uh, image here, he, he was a, a member of parliament and alongside John Edley Wilmot, uh, another member of parliament later, uh, a, a, a leading justice in London. Uh, they, uh, they oversaw the process in, in, in the UK. Uh, so if we can go to the next picture, slide, sorry. The Loyalist Claim Commission is, uh, well, I, I should say that when we, we, we got to the point of digitizing that, that material, we realized that that was a very white archive, overwhelmingly white, um, in which uh, the, the loyalists uh, who made their way back to Britain or to, uh, to Halifax uh, and, and made claims before the LCC, they tended to have had property in America uh, and were largely, um, obviously, European in ancestry. Uh, but that's not the complete picture uh, of, of loyalism uh, in the era of the American Revolution. Uh, a large number of uh, formerly enslaved African Americans made their way to British lines uh, and to British headquarters in New York City, uh, where they uh, were able to uh, petition the military government of New York uh, under uh, Lord Carl, uh, uh, under uh, the uh, Carlton and uh, under uh, generals uh, Birch and others uh, to sue for their freedom. Um, so uh, we wanted to recover the story of, of Marylanders uh, who, who were able to self-emancipate by fleeing to British lines, specifically during the Philadelphia campaign of 1777. Now, uh, the, the Howe brothers landed on their way to Philadelphia uh, in, uh, in, in Maryland uh, at the head of Elk uh, before marching up to Philadelphia as, as opposed to going uh, Overland through New Jersey, um, so uh, that that was a moment in which the war visited Maryland, albeit uh, for a short amount of time, uh, but also provided a a a, uh, a means through which African Americans can can secure their own freedom by fleeing to British lines. Um, at this point, I should also mention, and, and actually, I'll, I'll I'll leave this till we do our live demo. Uh, we came up with categories for uh, to when dealing with. Uh, 
people uh, that emerge from these records, and we'll, we'll talk about that in a bit. Uh, but I've been talking too long as well. At this point, I think let's uh, turn it over to uh, our, uh, our interns, uh, but not before <laughs> showing you this slide, which of course is uh, the, a, a list of, of, uh, of people uh, and institutions that have generously uh, uh, supported our initiative from the very beginning. We received funding from the Alma Honda Institute through a digital uh, a Lapidus Digital Initiative Grant, obviously the American Philosophical Society uh, and the Center for Textual Studies and Digital Humanities at Loyola University of Chicago have both hosted our material and will continue to do so. And of course, the wonderful interns from, uh, from the Star Center at Washington College have helped us really develop this, this material. And uh, I, I'm affiliated with Shepherd University who's also provided material help along the way as well. So thank you to our sponsors. Thank you, Ben. Um, so as he was mentioning, there's a big difference between the story of white loyalists and black loyalists. And these differences are seen um, pretty staggeringly through the different documentation that's offered. So for the stories of white loyalists in Maryland, um, we see those stories primarily through the Loyalist Claims Commission. So as was mentioned, this um, these are documents that's a method by which Maryland loyalists could gain compensation for their losses. Um, that occurred because of the American Revolution and because they remain loyal to the British Crown. So essentially they are, um, as you can see from the image on the top left, it says to the commissioners appointed by Act of Parliament for inquiring into the losses and services of the American Loyalists. So that's how each of these documents started and it's essentially an introduction that these Loyalists are going to explain how they remained loyal to the British Crown, what they did, whether that was um, fighting on the British lines, assembling men, um, promoting the British, the British crown and that cause uh, through writing. However that was, they're going to prove their loyalty, their demonstrated loyalty in that way. And they're also going to uh, prove that they lost something because of that, be it that they were injured, that they lost an office and they're seeking compensation for that lost salary, or most commonly that they lost property due to confiscation by the Patriots. So the individuals would present their case with the help of witnesses to corroborate that testimony to these commissioners um, in the hopes of getting compensation. They would present their narrative or their story and then they would list the claims as can be seen in the other image in the bottom right. So this example came from loyalist Jonathan Boucher, who as you can read, he claimed the losses of land, people and indentured servants and enslaved individuals, livestock, plantation utensils, and also household items for compensation. So he's listing off each of these items that were confiscated from his estate and the estimated value of them in hopes of getting compensation. So following this narrative and claim, you would see testimonials from witnesses. The role of witnesses was very important because the standard of proof was very high in order to um, maintain or obtain compensation. As can be seen from the numbers that were provided earlier, people were pretty highly unsuccessful in, main, in obtaining all that they claimed or all the compensation that they wanted. But the role of these witnesses and of documentation, supporting documentation was very important um, in order to get at least some compensation. The format of witness testimony was typically a shorter version of the prior two sections, so of the narrative and of the claims, and it would be either a corroboration of their narrative, so some sort of support of, yes, I saw what this individual did, I saw that they were very vocally and actively loyal to the British Empire and to the British cause, or it would be a corroboration of their property holdings. So either somebody who had seen their estate and they were familiar with the property that they held, or somebody who was familiar with the value of that property, whether um, they were skilled in estimation or they were an attorney, they were familiar with that property. In addition, they would um, provide supplemental documentation, so deeds to land, um, wills that proved inheritance from their fathers or family members, um, and also different records of debts that they may have had, either debts that others had to them or that they had to pay. So within this documentation, a lot of what we see are the stories of male loyalists, but there are some female memorials as well, and this is part of the project where we had to uncover those stories. 
So in the male memorialists, you see a lot of um, very valiant efforts. They are, they have fought for the British. They have lost so much because they remained so loyal. They did all of this and their requests are sort of a last resort. They're not looking to be a charity case or um, to have excessive sympathy or anything like that, but that they were loyal subjects and now they deserve this compensation because they need it because they lost so much fighting for the British. The story of female loyalists is a little less clear. There are also women included in the LCC documentation who have made their claims, but their experiences, their stories, and their narratives focus more so on the men in their life. So their husbands, sometimes their sons, or also their fathers, and they're telling the story of their husband, son, or father, and not necessarily their own story. During this time, the political affiliation of women was largely determined by their husband. So if their husband was an active loyalist, simply by remaining loyal to their husband and remaining connected to their husband, they were automatically a loyalist as well. It didn't really matter whether or not that was their personal political ideology, whether or not they particularly cared one way or another, whether or not they might have even supported the Patriot side, but because their husband was a loyalist, that identity was subsumed for them as well. So most women are claiming compensation for the property that their husband lost. They are speaking as a widow rather than um, by their own personal identity, it's all connected to their husbands. So, because they are speaking of their husband's property and because during this time, women did not have as much knowledge of the property, they typically were not involved as much in the estate or the finances for their husbands, they are less successful in making their claim. So for their husband, they are able to corroborate these statements. They know the property holdings. Um, all of the male memorialists have a lot more of it, this information just because that's typically how um, the separation of gender roles worked at the time. The women are operating on more assumptions or what they knew. That's not to say that all women didn't know much about their property, but that was the tendency at this time. And because they were less able to corroborate that story, their claims tended to be less successful. However, due to the patriarchal nature of British society, there was some success because they felt an obligation to care for these women who were now widowed and didn't have that same protection from their husbands. Some would even present themselves in language that um, made them seem more vulnerable or more in need of that protection in order to um, cater to that assumption of, um, or that uh, tradition of patriarchy. Regardless, many women were still relatively unsuccessful in their claims. To give a short example, um, there's the memorial that one of the memorials I transcribed was Elizabeth Delaney. Her memorial only references her late husband's involvement in the war and his political alignment as a loyalist. And after his death, she claims her right to dower, which is um, of the estate that has been confiscated. So essentially, she's claiming that confiscated estate, much like many of the male loyalists had done. She had a friend who served as her right to attorney, um, Mr. Montgomery, estimate her late husband's holdings and the value of that property. So again, that um, allows her to have that specificity that was needed. But there's also within her memorial a testimony from an individual who claims that the government shouldn't have to provide her dower because if they did, they would have to do that for all women who were widowed by a result of this war. Ultimately, she had requested over 10,000 sterling in compensation and received only 1,000 sterling. So her claim was not very successful. But her story is much bigger than this, and her memorial was unable to capture that because it focused so much on her husband and her husband's role in fighting on the British side. At this point, we must go beyond this LCC documentation and examine the story of female loyalists in a broader scope. So we're looking to stories of female loyalists um, as a whole within Maryland, also as a whole throughout the revolution. So during the war, there are a few different possibilities for women. Some of them took over caring for the estate and serving as protector for the family at home. There was um, an expectation kind of to hedge their bets that if the woman and the children stayed on the estate, that they would have um, a stronger case to prevent confiscation of that land. So they thought that if somebody was there, that the Patriots would not try to confiscate that British or that Loyalist estate. 
Um, that obviously wasn't necessarily the case for most people, but that was the idea, and so many women would stay at home. Alternatively, um, some women would join their husband um, as they served, and they would serve as camp followers on the British side. With this role, they would take on um, roles similar to those that they held at home. They would help with cooking, washing, cleaning, sewing clothing, um, hauling water and firewood, and also tending to the sick and wounded. This is a very broad scope of the story of female loyalists, but it offers a little bit more um, to their identity to understand that they have a story that goes beyond just their husband and their husband's role in the war. With these broader stories, we can make assumptions to fill in the gaps with some of these um, loyalist women in their, in their claims as memorialists, but there are obviously limitations to this. We can't necessarily attach all of these stories because it could be feasible that either of those roles or something entirely different was what was happening, but it helps us uncover a little bit more of their identity beyond just a relationship to their husband or other male relatives, and it gives them a little bit more agency in this situation. This is, um, this lack of information is similar with stories um, that we have uncovered throughout the course of this project, restoring the lives, identities, and stories of Black loyalists. And at this point, I'll turn it over to Jillian um, to explain a little bit more about that part of our project. Yes, thank you, Elizabeth. Um, so as both Elizabeth and Ben have already kind of touched on, um, right from the start of this project, we knew that we wanted to tell a more um, complete and inclusive narrative of Maryland loyalism. Uh, we wanted to expand the story beyond the typical subjects who, as it's been said, are mostly white, property-holding, um, politically active males um, to enslaved persons whose lives were also drastically altered as a result of the American Revolution. So we first encountered enslaved persons in our research um, in the Loyalist Claims Commission um, memorials. As Elizabeth said, they're listed um, often under the schedule of property and are pretty much exclusively referred to only in numerical quant uh, quantities instead of names. Uh, you can see in this first image on the slide um, that just that one line of text is defining 95 living, breathing uh, human beings. Um, and we felt immediately that we had to work to combat this kind of dehumanization of them in the historical record. But for a while, we really um, had no practical way of doing so. So with this issue weighing pretty heavily in the back of our minds as we continued our research, we actually made a huge stride in this effort to reassert Black loyalists into the loyalist story as a whole. Um, and that came when we looked into the inspection rules. And the inspection rules are basically uh, passenger lists for British ships carrying Black loyalist refugees to Nova Scotia. And all these people, people were formerly enslaved and had escaped bondage and run away to British army lines uh, where their freedom was promised by Lord Dunmore's proclamation. And um, they could, as Ben said, could petition General Birch for a General Birch certificate that guaranteed their freedom. Um, and what was so incredible about these records was that each person was listed by not only a first name, but also a last name um, and an age and the name of their former enslaver that they had escaped from, um, and also some physical descriptions. Uh, this was really a stark contrast from the LCC material that you've already seen um, really offers no information into the lives of these people. Um, and it really excited us because it opened the door for research into the experiences of Black loyalists before, during, and after their self-emancipation. Uh, so that was really powerful to shed some light on, but you know, amidst all that excitement, we still had the problem of restoring personhood to the enslaved listed in the LCC material. Um, and finally, uh, as we continued our research, we kind of saw a light at the end of the tunnel and this, uh, we found an outlet for starting to remedy this issue when we looked at the confiscation records of the American government. So these records are essentially a list of the purchases made at auctions of confiscated loyalist property. And I think our primary goal in first looking at these records was really just to see how honest the um, LCC petitioners were being to Parliament about their property, you know, comparing what they claimed and what was actually physically present at the auction and sold. Because, you know, they could be kind of exaggerating some holdings to get more money out of, um, out of Parliament. But um, and we did accomplish that, but we were also amazed to find this other opportunity within those records um, 
to kind of restore personhood to those enslaved. So every enslaved person present in those confiscation records is named. Um, and not only are they named, but they're also given ages, and in some cases, um, even familial relationships to one another are described. Uh, so you can see in the second image on the slide, uh, that's an image from the confiscation records for the Principio Company, which is um, a very large, or was a very large ironworks company in Maryland um, that enslaved those 95 people in that first image. Um, and you can see that each person is named. The first name is the, um, per the person who's purchasing them at this auction. And then we have Lydia, 16 years old, James, one year old, Paul, 28 years old, and the list goes on and on like that. Um, and so we, using this, um, both of these records together, we can kind of match up the names of the people from the confiscation records with just that number that was included in the LCC uh, memorial. Um, and we found this to be very rewarding because we now have a name to refer to these people that were mentioned in the memorial instead of just assigning them an arbitrary number, um, which we feel returns some dignity and humanity to their memory. Um, since the record also tells us who their next enslaver was, it also opens the opportunity to uh, continue researching in different kinds of records um, and kind of track the course of that person's life, uh, which is something we plan to do in the future to restore their narrative to the historical record. Um, and I'll just, I'll close with a quick plug for a blog post I'm writing on this topic that will speak a little more to the process of restoring personhood to enslaved persons that the historical, uh, that historical records too often deprive them of. Um, and now I think we're going to move on to give you a little demo of the project's website, um, beginning with uh, the scalar side. Okay, so uh, this is the website for the project. Uh, this here is our um, website we're planning on um, launching at the end of August, I believe. And this is our landing page. And so you start by just hitting welcome and it will take you into the page. And so here um, it opens with some general background on the project and some um, information on the different types of sources that we use and different types of sources that can be accessed on the site. Um, so we can start with the um, LCC material. So under contents, the, all those um, AO12 links, those are all Loyalist Claims Commission's material. Um, you can do AO128, I guess. <laughs> we transcribed a lot of the AO128. Um, and so clicking on that will take you to the contents of that volume and each memorialist is given their own page that you can then explore. So um, if you want to click on maybe the Graves Brothers, that was one that I transcribed that was a very thrilling narrative. So if anyone's checking out the site, I recommend looking at their memorial. Um, so right now there's a bunch of placeholder Latin, still a work in progress, but eventually that will be replaced with a biography for each individual. And if you scroll down, there are scans of each page of their memorial and that little um, kind of outlined box on it. If you yeah, um, kind of scroll over that, that brings you to the transcriptions that we've been doing all summer. Um, if you click on the page, you can get, yes, bring, there's the transcription. And yeah, if you scroll down and then you click on that, you can get to the scalar URL and see a larger image. Yeah, and within that, there's also like some citations and information about the specific um, page and source. And so then if you can bring us back to um, that first page, we can go into the inspection roles. Okay, yeah, so here the, um, the inspection rules right there. So if you click on them, it's pretty much um, the same process. So it'll take you to that volume. And if you scroll, it'll take you to a list of every Marylander listed in that record. Um, so if you click on any, maybe Rebecca Williams. 
So each Black Loyalist will also have a biography written to replace all of that Latin. Um, and if you click on the image of the record, it takes you to the same scalar URL. And the transcriptions are a little different here. Um, since there's so many people listed here from all over the colonies, this, this record isn't exclusive to Maryland. Um, we had to go through and kind of pick out the Marylanders. Um, we decided to just transcribe line by line those from Maryland, uh, since that's the scope of this project. Um, now, I think uh, if that's it, um, Elizabeth can now take you through the Omeka side of the site that focuses more on tabular data. Thanks, Jillian. So yeah, the Omeka site, uh, similar to the Scalar webpage, is still a work in progress. Um, we'll have our home and welcome pages, but this allows us to take the transcriptions and compile it into tabular data so that you can search individuals and then cross-reference um, by different relationships that they have. So if you scroll over people, you'll see that we have memorialists, witness, and mention. As Ben had alluded to earlier and I began to speak about, the memorialists are, in the case of the LCC, they're the ones making the claims. And then in the case of the inspection rule, they are the individual listed on that ship that Jillian um, just showed us in that documentation. The witnesses are individuals who have attested to their loyalty. So for the LCC, um, individuals who can vouch for their loyalty and property holdings. And then in the case of the inspection rule, um, General Birch or General Musgrave, and then mentioned becomes um, our catch-all category. So it can be a relatively broad category, but it allows us to um, understand other relationships that are happening. So um, anyone else who's mentioned in the memorial who might not uh, actually be a witness to them. And then in the case of um, the inspection role, we can then connect um, the individual to their former enslaver, which then might give us more information about um, their earlier parts of their life, not just um, from the war and beyond. So that's our hope there is to connect people more. So to give you an example um, from the LCC, if you'd like to search Bennett Allen, you can see um, how we um, populate this information. So as you can see, there are a couple fields that are typically that are very typical. They're general fields of name, their title, their gender, their profession, place of birth and place of death. And then you can see that uh, the people who they are um, have some sort of relation to their pages are also linked. So we've got siblings of, in Elizabeth Allen, different witnesses that spoke to um, Bennett Allen's loyalty or property holdings and then who he is a witness to. Below that, you see the category of who they enslaved, and that's more of what Jillian was um, speaking about. We are still in the process of uncovering more names by using um, the confiscation records, possibly also wills that might provide more of an identity to these people. For the moment, um, numbers are used as a placeholder, but that's something that we are um, diligently working on because we want to restore that identity and not perpetuate the um, discrimination and dehumanization that has happened through these historical records. Um, if you scroll further down, you can see their political affiliation and then also um, their, a link to their memorial. So um, the last little thing to give you an example of um, somebody in the inspection role, we could search Cato Ramsey. Now in this case, it's a little bit different because there isn't as much information about each individual in the inspection role, but we're still able to provide a good bit. So we see again, first and last name, their gender and their birth date. The witnesses, you see Thomas Musgrave because of the General Musgrave certificate, his political affiliation, his description as copied verbatim from the inspection role. So with that, we're trying not to make any assumptions or to offer anything um, beyond what is already there because we don't want to put words in people's mouths or anything we're using verbatim descriptions his place of origin his legal status of enslaved and then that he left his enslaver and when that happened the name of his former enslaver so that we can possibly draw more connections and then um further the ship that he boarded in order to sail to port mattoon and um self-emancipate 
So here there's also um, the link to his inspection role page, but you'll see in the notes that we've added, he may be the partner of Suki and the father of Kato. So this is again, us making uh, general assumptions, but not wanting to um, place an identity on an individual that isn't accurate, but trying to draw more connections for further information. In this case, um, Kato Ramsey, Suki and Kato were all one after the other in the inspection role. They came from similar, um, from the same region, Suki and Kato, Ramsey are of similar age, and it is specifically listed that Kato is the son of Suki. So that's something that um, we are trying to determine whether that is an actual relationship, but we're offering that possible assumption so that further research can be done um, to either verify that or build off of that or to deny it possibly. But um, the point of this is that the scalar and the Omeka work together to provide um, the images and the transcriptions, but also offer for searchable data and um, more explicit connections between different individuals. So that just about concludes our presentation. The project is still obviously a work in progress. Um, and with all of the information we've uncovered, we've uncovered even more questions. Um, I'll turn it back over to Ben, Kyle, or Jillian if you guys have closing remarks, but we can also um, open up the floor for any questions. Well, that was great. Thank you so much for that um, you know, wonderful sort of overview. And I realized that to take 10 weeks worth of work and to kind of cram it into half an hour uh, is not a, a simple thing to do at all. Um, so we now have about uh, 12 minutes for questions. Uh, feel free to use the raise hand feature. Um, and or if you have something you want to throw in the chat, we can use that as well. Um, I'm going to just maybe start us off with a, a sort of uh, an initial question. Can you maybe just share a little with us your experience of the internship in terms of is this project done or are there all sorts of future directions that you're kind of finding yourself at at week 10? I, this is a very easy question to answer. I, there's definitely so many new directions and questions that we've come up with. Um, in particular, one of the things that we last week, um, you know, like the second to last week really kind of dove into was the idea of creating a, um, a network, like a network, um, visualization kind of um, of you know those memorialists and their witnesses and the mentioned and kind of visually representing that world and kind of investigating how interconnected it was who were the major players um, and that was something that I was I am super excited about I think that's such a great idea and I can see that fitting so well into this project but of course we only have now one day left so <laughs> that's gonna have to be um, a future direction yeah, definitely. There's still tons of more questions to answer. I think that, um, as Julian was mentioning, we got really excited by our work with the confiscation records in the Principio Company and finally finding names for these individuals. And so doing that for more of the memorialists and then diving deeper, looking at um, who their um, who they are enslaved by now, and then looking at those wills and the uh, like family records from those individuals to uncover more about their life. So understanding that their life isn't just their enslavement and really fulfilling, figuring out ways that we can fill in those blanks from different parts of the story before, during, and after the revolution. And then also um, speaking to different audiences, finding ways to make this information accessible. So um, whether that's descendants wanting to figure out more information or it's academics doing this research or, um, really anything people from Maryland curious to know more about the history of Maryland. So finding ways that we can make this information accessible and engaging for different types of audiences is another thing that I'd love to explore more. Yeah, those are, I think, fantastic uh, ways forward. Uh, looks like James Hill, I think, do you have, you have your hand raised? Do you have a question? Yes. Um, are there any records in Nova Scotia that are helpful? The other end of the ship's journeys? Great question. And there are, yes. Um, now, it, it, especially for when it comes to understanding the network of Maryland loyalism on the, uh, on, on the Canadian side, uh, many, um, many of these settlements were 
uh, segregated to a degree. So um, there are records of, of land uh, allotments on the other side. So we could possibly uh, trace the um, uh, those listed in the inspection rolls, uh, uh, trace out their story or map it out uh, in Canada. And uh, further field in Sierra Leone, uh, because of course many, uh, many of those uh, black Nova Scotian communities um, are, go through a further migration uh, later on in the 18th century when the, uh, the British colony of Sierra Leone is, 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 is founded. So there's, there's a scope to really uh, utilize this metadata and this, the, the work that our, our interns have done to flesh out a much larger Atlantic story for both black and white loyalists. Thank you. I feel like maybe we need to have Elizabeth and Jillian come back next summer and we uh, send them up to Nova Scotia to, <laughs> to dig into those records up there. You importantly um, mentioned the sort of need to get this before the public or ways to get it before the public. And I wonder if you might just reflect a little as two people, one who's grown up in Maryland, one who lives sort of adjacent to Maryland, who both go to school in Maryland. Do Marylanders remember this part of the American Revolution? I think that um, similar to loyalists everywhere, there's not a whole, there's not a whole lot of focus on loyalists in the revolution. We focus a lot on, I mean, even coming from a school named after George Washington, we focus a lot on the patriots of the revolution and their success. And so, um, but I think that there's definitely, especially like coming into this as a resident of Maryland and knowing different information about the history, um, filling in those blanks about even just things as simple as like, who is this county or this location named after and what is the um, history behind that is definitely, um, it's, it's piqued my interest a lot. I think that there are, uh, there's a lot of focus on the other side. And so uncovering that untold story, especially for individuals who um, aren't often focused on is, is something that people are now gaining an interest in, especially in terms of um, uncovering the history of black individuals in America and their stories that have so long been stifled. I'm muted, sorry. Uh, looks like we have a question from uh, Hannah Anderson. Hi, great work, you guys. Thanks so much for your presentation. Uh, my question was just sort of along similar lines. Um, I was going to ask you both how thinking about loyalists or researching them more deeply and uh, thinking about people who are often seen as the losers of the revolution, if that's made you think differently about the conflict as a whole or sort of narratives that you may have learned earlier in your sort of educational career, that's made you change your assessments of the event at all. Yeah, um, I think it's definitely kind of broadened my view, you know, growing up um, like K through 12 education. Um, the only thing when you're learning about the revolution, loyalists are really just kind of like a one sentence footnote. That's like, yeah, there were loyalists, but they lost and you know, they deserved it. So we won. Yay. Um, but, you know, this project has really opened my eyes to just a more complete vision. I, I'd never really thought about loyalists as really um, like war, war refugees. Um, they were displaced and, you know, these records show that they lost a lot. Um, and that was just, it's a perspective I've never looked at it before. And it definitely um, just provides a more, a more human uh, kind of representation of the conflict. You know, it wasn't just good versus evil, um, you know, freedom versus taxation without representation or something like that. Um, you know, these were real people who were um, in a very uncertain situation um, and they did the best they could to, you know, survive it. Yeah, I have to, I definitely agree with that. I think that um, our research into the loyalists has provided a much bigger picture to a lot of this and it goes to show that um, like certain, it goes beyond just ideologies of, oh, I like the British, oh, I wanna be free. It's 
um, very individual stories. You see their loss, the fact that they become refugees, they're seeking asylum in New York City or going back to, um, going to Canada or back to the British Isles. And then you also see um, the like human self-interest part of it because there were families who were split and it wasn't necessarily an ideological difference, but just trying to make sure that, okay, whichever side wins, like our family's still gonna be okay. Or um, you see a lot more nuance to these stories rather than just, oh, the British people were evil. They wanted to tax us and they wanted to control us and we wanted our freedom. Like, it, like Jillian was saying, it's not just good versus bad. It's very nuanced. Um, part of history to understand each of these individuals and their experiences. Yeah, can I j just jump in quickly and, and just uh, say um, something off the back of that last statement. I think one of the, one of the, you know, an amazing thing that has come out of the research that both uh, Jillian and Elizabeth has done is the degree to which, um, you know, loyalty or commitment to the revolution, it, you know, it goes beyond ideology in many cases. So when you think about the Principio Company papers that they, uh, that the, the, the interns sort of transcribed for us and went over in the confiscation records, uh, the act of breaking up those large properties uh, might in itself uh, be an act in which, you know, in which the, the Maryland legislature is, is um, ingratiating itself to the people who might be on the on the fence. So if, if you divvy up these large estates, uh, you have uh, the people who are purchasing this property might have a new commitment to the state, not based on ideological commitment to the the cause of liberty, but to the fact that if 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 the patriots lose the property they've just purchased at pretty good prices from the Maryland legislature, then reverts back to its original owner. So you have you know that added sort of, uh, you know, that, that different uh, sort of commitment to the revolution that, that's, uh, that's tied to self-interest. So both on the loyalist side and the patriot side, this project has given us this more nuanced view of, of, uh, uh, of what it is to take a side, I guess, in this revolution, what freedom means. Looks like we have a question here from Jawan Johnson from the Star Center. Thanks so much for being with us today. Thank you so much, um, Kyle and, and Ben, for the wonderful work you've done with our students over the past 10 weeks. I first want to um, just congratulate Elizabeth and Jillian just on a, a job well done. <laughs> um, I've definitely learned a lot because I'm new to Maryland, been in the state for a year, so uh, you've definitely enlightened me uh, today. Um, but I, and, and broadly about the internship experience, I want to know um, how do you plan to apply this learning experience to um, your studies at, at Washington College. Um, so that's my question. Um, one, one way is um, I've kind of, you know, I'm a rising junior, so I have to start thinking about a thesis um, for my senior capstone experience. And I can definitely see myself um, incorporating this, this material um, into a thesis perhaps, and also just using, you know, the research skills um, I've gained in whatever thesis topic I choose. Um, you know, transcription, I've, I've never really done, um, I've read histor like historical documents before, but never really actual transcribing, um, which is a really great skill to have. Um, and yeah, just more context about that time period in general that um, I'm very interested in. So it'll definitely apply to my future. I think, um as Kyle was referencing in the introduction, my studies so far have been um, sort of like tangentially related, not directly related to the study of history, but um, I've seen a lot of integration throughout the summer between my studies of philosophy and sociology with um, understanding history and historical records and the way that we build um, archives and present that information. So um, it's the understanding that our 21st century lens and our perception of these information of this information and these documents might not always be the complete truth. And in fact, it is never the complete truth. So just understanding that um, we have to question all of these things and try to find the different possible interpretations in order um, to hopefully uncover a more complete story and to understand the relationships between different people and how um, our presentation of this information, the people and those relationships can then um, impact our audience or our viewers and understanding this history and how it relates to today. And so I've definitely learned a lot more about how um, 
uh, primary sources and different types of data can um, give you a different lens or skew your interpretation of things one way or another um, and how to combat that so that future researchers can look at this data with a more or this information with a more open mind and with a more open interpretation not assigning certain um, very easy assumptions to different stories wonderful answers thank you so much uh, final question just for Ben. So if our uh, audiences at home have watched this and want to get involved, is there still work to be done on the Maryland Loyalism Project? You betcha. There's a lot of work to be done. Um, initially, we, we thought that this might be a project that could lead to, uh, to a large scale digitization of the LCC material. Uh, and to the inspection roles for the Carlton papers, uh, or at least to interpreting those 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 documents uh, uh, better. Uh, but you know what we found is just that the 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 records on the ground in Maryland are so rich that there we we were kind of thinking that we want to just explore this further. So as Julian and Elizabeth have mentioned, there are uh, there's a lot of work to be done in probate records, will records to try to follow uh, confiscated enslaved people uh, in the uh, in the post-war era. Uh, there's a lot of work, as we've heard from our questions, uh, wonderful questions today to, to advance more um, uh, time towards exploring Canadian records um, and uh, possibly West African records when it comes to Sierra Leone. So there are there's a lot that needs to be done. And if anybody is interested, I'd be happy to uh, share my my email uh, address in the comments here, uh, and it, feel free to contact contact me, and uh, we uh, we can fill you in on what's going on and what direction the project's going in. Well, thank you all for being with us today. A special thanks to Jillian and Elizabeth for a fantastic summer and a great presentation. So, a round of applause to them for their great work. And your enjoy your final day. <laughs> I look forward to talking to you guys tomorrow. Uh, next Tuesday, please join us for the uh, second uh, kind of brown bag series with our summer interns, Anna Schiff and Teddy Sandler. We'll be presenting on their work um, with Dave McCullough and Emily Margolis on uh, the climate science exhibit, which is coming in 2022. So be well, everyone, and we'll see you next week. Thank you. Thank you.